Hi, and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McManaman. On this show, more with Gary Brown and Wealth Creation. Mark Kilroy will be with us on how to get the most out of depreciating your home. And we will hear from our panel. But first, Martin with Finance for Business. I'm here with Martin from Finance for Business, and he's our special guest. He's going to talk about all things finance, small business. Now over to you, Martin. Thank you for coming in today. Oh, look, thank you for the opportunity, Gary. Um, I want to talk to you about business finance. I do a, work in a specialist area, which is working capital. So um, my job is to help people in small and medium business get the liquidity they need so that they can run their business efficiently, but more importantly, they can meet their growth obligations and their aspirations for investment and things like property. So you could say you're a strategic, working capital strategic advisor? advisor? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I suppose that's what you do because the universal thing for small business in Australia is that they don't have enough working capital, which is a bit to do with our banking system. And people don't really understand what working capital is. I hear so many people talk to me about, I've got a cash flow problem. And it's not really cash flow, it's, it's about their working capital because what happens is you buy your goods here, then you add your value to the goods, whatever it may be, or your services, and then you sell them here and you have to wait till here until you get paid. So this bit in between we call the cash gap. And that's what, where you don't have sufficient working capital to cover it. And as you grow, that situation becomes more acute. If, you're, uh, if your business has a $1 million turnover, you're going to need about $200,000 worth of working capital. But if you grow your business to $2 million turnover, you're going to need $400,000 worth of capital. Yeah. Exactly. So it's something that needs to grow as your business grows. If you have sufficient working capital, you can pay your suppliers on time, you can get discounts from your suppliers for early settlements. It gives you a lot of flexibility, but most businesses are sort of living hand to mouth, trying to manage that they don't have enough working capital where they began. So if I don't have enough working capital in my business, what, what options are there? What can we do? Well, it depends on, on your business, but what I find most businesses have debtors, people that owe the money. So I talk about borrowing from your balance sheet and your debtors are on your balance sheet, and they're a consistent thing. You know, generally, um, if you've got a million dollar turnover, you're gonna have somewhere between 150 and 200 Ks worth of debtors. So you can actually fund that using a tool called invoice or debtor finance, which uh, enables you to have that cash at the moment you write the invoice. So it all of a sudden changes your liquidity in the business because you no longer have to wait to get that cash in. So it gives them a lot more flexibility um, it's, you know, it has some issues. It's not as, um, as low a cost as, say, borrowing on a, on a mortgage. But um, I, I think people need to understand when you're in business, you've got a lot of risk. Um, and I talk to them about using their balance sheet rather than risking the family home, for example, to, to build the business. You know, use the assets within the business to fund the business. Absolutely, absolutely. And then what about financing working capital through an overdraft Facility. Well, in, in many cases, overdrafts are good for temporary situations. And one of the problems I see in businesses is they use an overdraft and it actually becomes a long-term <laughs> debt. Uh, an overdraft should be an in-and-out type situation. So um, many clients, and particularly today because liquidity is tight in the marketplace and the economy is a little bit uncertain in certain areas, that uh, I often set up a client initially with an overdraft an unsecured overdraft you can currently get put together in about three or four days. That gives them some short-term relief for their cash flow issues. But then I prefer to use something like the debtor finance as a longer-term borrowing because it's secured against your debtors. It doesn't affect your, cap your capacity to pay other mortgages because it's a more or less a, an interest-only facility that comes out of your debtors. So it's much more flexible than having a, a, a longer advance or a cash flow loan or something like that. What industries are probably best for that type of debtor finance? Which ones would we target? Um, a lot target? of, look, I'm, I'm doing at the moment a lot in construction um, because uh, there's delays in payments, I suppose. Any business where you have to wait for your money. So for example, it's not relevant to retail yep. because generally retail is paid for at, at the point of sale. Yep. Um, but many other businesses, particularly wholesale, 
um, and wholesale businesses, they're things they have to pay for their goods. They then hold them and sell them to their customers. They have to wait for their customers to pay them. So they, they're, they're someone that uses a lot. In construction at the moment, I have one um, uh, construction client who is using debt of finance, waiting for his developers to pay him. But he has a reason he's using debt of finance. He now pays all his construction subcontractors in 14 days. Yep. So he said, I said, well, why are you doing this? You know, most people pay their subcontractors in 30 or 45 days. He said, because I pay my subcontractors in 14 days, I get the best subcontractors that do the best job for the best price. And so therefore I have a competitive advantage against his competitors. And they keep coming back too. And they come back and they're all happy to work for him. Yeah. Whereas many subcontractors get caught and have to wait 45, 60 days for their money. Well, one of the other things that is quite popular at the moment is a thing called trade finance. So on this side of the ledger, debt of finance looks after our accounts receivable. Yep. Uh, trade finance is slightly different because it looks after our accounts payable. Now, trade finance was initially developed to for overseas trade, yep. but it is now available from a lot of the fintechs to actually pay your suppliers. So if you use trade finance this side and debt of finance this side, you can solve your cash gap because you've got a lot of liquidity, but you can also talk to your suppliers and say, look, I'll now pay you in seven days instead of 45. Can I have a 5% discount? Correct. And, you'll, you'll, you know, and your cost of funds are perhaps 2% for that time. Yep. So you can use liquidity as a major business enabler to lower your costs and give you the ability to expand. You see, if you have enough liquidity in your business, you can grow. But if you don't, you can't. Correct, correct. So when we're in a growth phase of the business, we want to be looking at our working capital requirements, looking at that growth side from increasing revenue from a monthly, yearly cycle, then look at where can we fund that working capital from? Are we able to put in money from outside of the business? Do we need to get some form of finance? And that's where you guys come in and help. Um, and I guess one other thing to consider is when we're looking at this is just weighing up the costs and making sure that we have the profit in that job or whatever work we're doing, we have the profit in there to be able to pay for the finance side of things. Exactly. Look, and if you know that, you know, if a simple rule of thumb to think about debt of finance is it's going to cost you percent, maybe a percent and a half a month. Yep. So I've got a client that's going to take 60 days to pay me. So at a percent and a half a month, I load the job 3%. Yeah. So once you know that and... One of the good things is, as the business grows, your debtors grow. Yes. So when you have something like debt of finance, it automatically increases as the business grows. So it all of a sudden is the secret to unlocking liquidity in the business and giving you the ability to grow. And if you've got you know ten percent profit margin, fifteen percent profit margin, you know it's better to look at the growth phase of the business, grow the business pay the finance costs and continue to grow because you've got the profit margin there to do it. And this is one method that allows you to do it. Rather than doing the method that I see far too often as an accountant is people not paying ATO bills. And you know, obviously that's frustrating as an accountant, as a taxpayer, as an ATO, we're all frustrated at that. And we see that that's probably one of the main sources of funding in business because people don't know that these other options exist. Oh, exactly. And one of the great things about the sorts of finance I'm talking about is the banks won't fund you if you have ATO debt. Yeah. Um, because the debtors are the security, most debtor funders they will. will do it with ATO debt. And uh, I'd say 90% of my customers have ATO debt, but uh, the ATO is getting tight now. Yep. So what we had with COVID, it was an easy way to get some liquidity. But now you've got to look at paying back the ATO. And I've got several clients that are using debtor finance to service their ATO obligations. That makes sense. Mm. Well, thank you very much for coming in today. I appreciate, I appreciate it. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your time, Gary. It's been great. Thank you. In today's segment, we're going to talk about how to build the best property portfolio for you. So things that we need to consider here is the level of income you have, the equity that you currently have in your house, the cash that you have on hand, the level of debt that you want to go up to, what future costs, what future costs you may have when in regards to children. We also want to understand what the end goal is of having the property portfolio. Is it to generate a passive income of $100,000? Is it to have five properties near the beach? 
You've got to have a clear defined strategy which involves having a determined amount of income and the locations of your property. How long do you reckon it would take you to build this portfolio? Do you have five years to build it? Do you have 10 years? These are really important things to consider when looking at your property portfolio. The longer you have to build a property portfolio, the higher chances you have at achieving your outcome. One big thing to consider is when is enough enough? How many properties do you want to own or the family own and when you're gonna be satisfied? I like to think of this as a way of looking at how much passive income those properties generate me. If the passive income is higher than my wages or business income, that's when I determine enough is enough. But you might have a different belief. So when is enough enough is really important. When we build a property portfolio, we want to look at negative geared properties, cash flow positive properties, and put them all together into a balanced portfolio. What I mean by this is, it might be really beneficial to have negatively geared properties under the main breadwinner and may be useful to reduce their taxable income. But likewise, to fund that negative property, it might be a good idea to have a cash flow positive property, but have that under the second spouse or under a trust. So having a mixture between negatively geared properties, having a mixture of cash flow positive properties, putting them into a balanced portfolio and looking at the overall arching strategy is critical in building the right property portfolio. I want to take you through an example now of what we could achieve by building a property portfolio that could be right for you. Say you're an Australian, you earn $91,000 of taxable income, you're currently paying 34.5% tax, you might determine that buying a negatively geared property is in your best interest. So you might buy that under your personal name. Whereas your second property may be a high cash flow property. It could be one in Perth, co-living property with a 14% return on investment. That may be better suited to buy under a trust or under your spouse. Then you might build out a third property and a fourth property and play around with which property comes next in determining your overall passive income. Because remember, with a negatively geared property, you will be able to save the taxes from the depreciation, interest and expenses. They'll get saved in proportion to the marginal tax rate. And with a cash flow positive property, it's going to cause you to pay tax. So you want to pay tax under the lowest marginal tax person and or investment trust. I'm Gary Brown. Keep learning and take control of your financial future. Mark, thank you for joining us on the new property show today. Uh, CEO and founder, uh, you're in depreciation, is that correct? That's right, yep, for the last 20, 22 years. Okay, so um, are you looking just after new properties or secondhand or in residential and commercial? Do you want to tell us a little bit of the story with how that came to be? Yeah, well, I sort of fell into depreciation back in the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, it's obviously my accent. <laughs> um, so I've been working in it for 22 years. Uh, started uh, a company called Ernst & Young doing tax depreciation, or it's called Capital Allowances in the mm -hmm. UK all based on case law. Uh, I was uh, sort of poached to come over to Australia and set up a tax team over here with uh, a number of companies. Uh, did that, decided to set up on my own uh, probably about 10 years ago or something. Uh, and yeah, it's just grown, grown since then. Uh, residential and commercial depreciation. So you're Queensland based at the moment, but it's a national business, is that correct? That's right, yeah. So live in the best state. I don't know if I should say that with your <laughs> viewers, but uh, I live on the Gold Coast. Uh, we're a national business, spend a lot of time in Melbourne and Sydney. Um, but yeah, yeah, Gold Coast, Brisbane based. We do, we do talk about on the show Queensland being one of the best places to invest, so it's okay. It's, a, it's safe with the viewers. All good. Uh, but what I'd like to ask you now is, uh, do you want to just run us through what tax depreciation is and, and the report? Uh, how that actually works and what the benefit of having that versus not getting a report done. Yeah, yeah. So depreciation, it's an accounting term mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's used, you know, in many countries of the world, Australia being one of them, US, UK. Uh, and um, it's a way of uh, identifying your assets, which will go down in value as they mm -hmm. get older, mm -hmm. goes down in value. And it's a uh, uh, a method of accounting for uh, the value it goes down on an annual basis. So um, 
<coughs> you know, in, in Australia, uh, we're quite lucky here that we can depreciate residential property assets uh, as long as it's income producing. So if it's an investment property, you can claim depreciation on it. It's pretty unique. Can't do this in the UK, for example. So Australia is a fantastic place to invest uh, and claim depreciation. Okay, so if you are building a new property, uh, when's the best time to engage your services? And does the property actually need to be complete for this report to, to begin? So uh, new build properties, we yep. do them all the time. Um, generally, uh, as long as we've got the specification, uh, we've got the, the plans of the property, we mm -hmm. don't actually have to do a physical site inspection. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all, if you're doing house and land, it's generally based on the construction cost. Uh, if it's a purchase, you know, we go out and value the property. We value the construction costs. We, we identify all the plant and equipment within that property uh, and put a value to that. And, you know, uh, that's what you can depreciate. And what about for the people that have built a house, they forgot to do the depreciation report? There might be six to 12 months in, there's a tenant moving in there. How would you service, obviously you're in uh, Queensland, somebody's purchased a property in WA. How do you service that client? Yeah, so we, we've got 180 uh, surveyors that mm -hmm. we've got access to through our partnership with Jim's Building Inspections. Mm -hmm. So um, we pretty much can cover every part of Australia to do a survey, and we can do that within uh, a few days. We can arrange that. <clears throat> One of the points I wanted to bring up about depreciation, and you know, a lot of your, view your viewers have probably heard of depreciation, it's still that there's only 40% of people actually claiming depreciation in the tax return, which is absolutely absurd to mm -hmm. me. And it's the likes of myself and other people that go out and try and educate them to, to claim depreciation. Because another unknown fact is that when somebody sells a property, mm -hmm. uh, an investment property, and you're calculating capital gains tax, the ATO will actually take into consideration the depreciation that you've not claimed in the calculation for uh, for CGT, it's an excellent tip. So if you've, <laughs> it doesn't matter if you if you've not claimed depreciation, the ATO is going to take it into account later on when you sell the property. So you may as well do it straight away. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up paying you know more in effect CGT. Are these these reports expensive or, or quite no. affordable? It's uh, so you know in terms of the new build, it's anywhere from three nine five plus GST right away up to if you're doing a full site survey, 695 plus GST. But the returns you're getting back are significantly more than that. Um, you know, the average returns on new build properties, mm -hmm. uh, you know, anywhere from uh, a house and land could be, you know, 13,000 upwards. Uh, units could be $20,000 upwards. Obviously, it all depends on what the, uh, the, the purchase price is and what the build cost is. But, um, you know, that is significant tax savings that should be in your pocket rather than the ATO. So great question here. Would you own a new property or second hand then? I think the difference, I've always gone to second hand properties. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I've been an investor for, for close to 20 years myself. I've always bought the worst house on the best street. That mm -hmm. was always my mentality. Um, in terms of new builds, you know, you've got to look at, weigh up the options. Uh, you know, what is the maintenance cost mm -hmm. of, of doing the properties? Does it need any capital work spent on it? Uh, and the other factors is that a new build property, you're getting... Uh, depreciation deductions on all the plant and equipment and we haven't really touched on mm -hmm. that with uh, there were some legislation changes put in that some of your viewers might have heard about in May, 20, uh, May 2017 where it, uh, <clears throat> where second hand property uh, second hand properties couldn't claim mm -hmm. division 40 plant and equipment allowances so you, you know you could only claim it on the actual building not to go into Mm -hmm. you know, technical thing, but it does affect uh, what you can claim back. What about things that are, um, let's just pick off some, rattle off some items that people think you can or can't depreciate. Um, so for example, things like blinds, air conditioning, landscaping, fences, a couple of external items. Uh, is there some of those things that people should be um, wary about not overspending on? Well, I always look at it, you know, if you've got a, a property, turn it mm -hmm. upside down, shake it, what comes out? Yeah. Uh, you know, you, obviously your blinds are going to be screwed or whatever, but in effect, it's any of those loose items that 
you know, fall out, mm -hmm. uh, is classed as what you call plant and equipment. So it's two different types of depreciation. You've got what you call capital works, which mm -hmm. is the structure, the mm -hmm. building, the, you know, the, mm -hmm. the tile floor, all the fixed stuff is all called uh, capital works and you claim it under what you call division 43. Mm -hmm. You then got all that loose stuff that you tip upside mm -hmm. down, all your blinds and all that sort of stuff. And you, that's called plant and equipment allowances. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, under Division 40, and, and it, you depreciate that at a much higher rate. And when we talk about depreciation rates, it's all based on what the asset life uh, is on that particular mm -hmm. asset. Um, uh, and the ATO have got you know a list of thousands of uh, assets right the way from mining, mm -hmm. uh, plant and equipment through to restaurant equipment. Uh, right the way through to residential investment property equipment. And they basically tell you how long the asset uh, will last for, and that's what you depreciate uh, the equipment over. Okay, interesting question here. One of the investment strategies we talk about uh, on the new property show is dual keys, duplexes, and co-living plans. Um, are we paying twice for those reports, or is it, or is it one report? Because you've got two kitchens. Yeah two bathrooms, how would that work? Yeah, and we, we just, if it's under the one entity, mm -hmm. so you've got the one entity, then we just charge the fixed fee for the for the report. It doesn't add a lot of extra work to identify this two stoves, mm -hmm. two cooktops, you know, it's pretty much the, uh, the same amount of work. So we just charge a fixed fee for that. Excellent. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add that you think is of value that uh, that our viewers should, should hear about? I just, uh, you know, I just, want any of you viewers out there if they're not claiming depreciation to really look at uh, look into uh, getting that done speak to your accountant um, and really you know use that opportunity because the ATO will get the money back off you at some point mm -hmm. so uh, you may as well claim it from day one excellent and the last one with the schemes uh, I remember when I've depreciated a few vehicles over the um, so vehicles and of course property over the time uh, I've used a more aggressive scheme where it was over a seven year period. I got a maximum return, uh, so I was depreciating the asset quicker. Uh, does that still exist? Yeah, so I think what you're probably referring to is uh, there's two methods of depreciation. Yeah. yeah, so uh, you've got uh, your prime cost yeah. method, which is pretty much like straight line, the same yeah. amount each year, or diminishing value, which is a much accelerated rate. Yeah. Um, I'd say 95% of, uh, of investors want the money up front, the accelerated rate. So, um, yeah, so that's the most popular method of... Uh, is that uh, Section A or B? <laughs> uh, I don't know what you're, but um, in terms of diminishing value, it's definitely the most popular. But we give you both methods, and it's up to your accountant to to choose what method uh, you know he chooses. Fantastic, Mark. You've been a really fun guest to have on the new property show, and thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me. All right, guys, we're going to talk about current housing crisis today and uh, your, your thoughts on it and views. Um, who wants to kick us off? I reckon Ian would be the man. Yeah, I'll start. Um, housing crisis. We've got ridiculous rents. Um, we've had, we've got low vacancy rates and there's only one way rents are going to go from that. So from the first quarter of when COVID hit, through to today, we've had an increase in some areas of 75% for rental properties pricing. And at the same token, um, you know, this, this seesaw effect that happens in property, you've got um, property prices going up and rents usually stagnate until the point of where renters say, well, actually I, can, I, I can't afford to, to buy. So they keep renting and then the rentals go up and then they can afford to buy because it's about the same price. That's not happening at the moment. We've got both property prices and rentals going up at the same time and the crisis needs to stop somehow. You normally don't see that. You normally basically would see in terms of uh, people are holding off buying, but at the moment even getting into the market's a bit tough. Mm. Um, and obviously, I know we focus a little bit on this show about the new property show, but happy to open it up. Um, what's, the, what's the price, medium and, and range that you're seeing across the range? That are you seeing in terms of you're only seeing more depreciation reports coming out or people are like tightening up on their spending or what's happening? Yeah, we've been, you know, unaffected uh, so far. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, I know personally myself in terms of, 
you know, the yields you're getting and obviously, you know, everybody's being affected with interest rates going up. You know, it's getting tighter and tighter. It's getting harder and harder. So, uh, you know, the market is uh, going to lose, you know, <laughs> some of those rental properties in the market, whether, you know, the bank repossesses them or, or, or whatever. So we have got to become a bit more creative in terms of our housing policies. And I love what you were saying uh, before, Ian, about the the co-living and, 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 you know, these policies that has got to be brought in by government, you know. Um, uh, for me, we opened up uh, a couple of Airbnbs was one of our solution and it was fantastic when COVID was around, um, you know, straight after COVID and you couldn't travel overseas and were pretty full most of the time and it's, it's got tighter and tighter now. People have started going overseas, so that market's pretty much you know, dried up a lot in the Sunshine Coast. So we have got to find new ways, be a bit more creative around it. Unless you can get fantastic finance deals, which Martin I'm sure could uh, assist with, you've got to, you know, become a bit more creative. Make sure you can claim every deduction you can, including depreciation and, or, you know, work with your accountant to claim everything back uh, you're due to, you know, so you pay as little tax as possible this year, you know. For the coming future. Would you say, Martin, obviously too, it's not only just housing that's affected, it's, bi it's businesses, because the two really go hand in hand as much as you want to individually run a household, um, the performance of the household is typically leaning in on the business. What are you seeing happening in the business sector there? Well, in the business sector now, we're seeing a lot of collapses in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, change is a good thing. Um, I like to think counter cyclically. So, you know, the situation is that there's a lot of downward talk in the economy. Uh, but we're here talking about the crisis, and the crisis is a shortage, and I'm a bit of a student of economics, and there's a thing called supply and demand that drives those things. So simply we're seeing that there is some change and issues in the construction industry because things need to change, but long term investment in property has got to be great. We've got a, we've got a uh, situation where high interest rates are frightening people away, but really the long term, particularly with immigration coming back into the country, the shortages are only going to increase. So um, the wise investor now is perhaps looking at doing something in, in an environment where everyone's talking against it, or many economic pundits are, and taking advantage of the circumstances that are here right now. I think too, with increased pricing going up and increased rent, uh, it also could cause quite an explosion. But on the on the opposite side of that, if and you may see this too, Ian, but if people aren't meeting their rental repayments, uh, or sorry, their, their mortgage repayments, there could be a um, there could be a position, and I think there is a solution to this. But there could be a position where people are kicked out of their houses. But I'm suggesting to people, um, if you've got rooms to rent, just right now become a landlord. Like it's just weather the storm. Uh, yeah. Is that a solution too that you put forward to do everyday mum and dads? Yeah, it is yeah. a solution to be able to do to turn your properties into co-living. You just be very wary of the. It's it's a very very detailed. Um, approval process and if you mm -hmm. get it wrong you could end up in jail like mm -hmm. it's as serious as that when you when you when you're catering for the community and putting co-living properties together to fix a housing solution if you don't get the right approvals if you don't get the right insurances you could end up in jail um, and their fines are huge up to two hundred twenty thousand dollars and in victoria as an example there's an eight and a half years jail time if you get it wrong so for me i look at why is it australia that always ends up as an unaffordable home and housing country you know Every year they release the top 20 most unaffordable cities living home. So they compare wages versus um, the cost of, the, of living in a home. Um, Australia has 14 of the top 20 every year. That starts with Hong Kong being number one, Sydney number two, um, Auckland number three, Melbourne number four generally. Um, three years ago, Hobart was mm. the most, second most unaffordable city in the world. And to be controversial, it's because everyone put their place on Airbnb. Mm. So you took long-term rentals off the marketplace while I was talking to you. <laughs> um, um, but, uh, it's getting but hot. Hobart was an example, <laughs> yeah. right? Because there was 80,000 homes that got taken off the long-term rental market. There was nothing available to rent. And the people in Hobart don't earn as much as what they do on the mainland, yet the housing cost was higher. So that's now stabilised and, and levelled out because of what you said, that trend yeah. that came off Airbnb. Uh, but, you know, it's not just the housing availability because we've got low vacancy rates, we've got more people coming into the country, and then we've got trade shortages, you know? I want to talk about that, um, Robbie. So yourself and friends, you're in obviously building. Um, what's going on with trades? Like I'm seeing houses nowadays that used to be six to nine months builds. Yep. They're sort of blowing out past 12 months. Um, 
yes, we want to solve the, the crisis, and, and it's on a front, but it's, the crisis is really, as you're saying there, Martin, it's actually quite a good crisis in some aspects, depending on whether you're a renter or not. Um, but on your side, uh, what's happening out on, out on site? Like, how are you, you you're retaining your trades, or are they all move to, into different industries? What's happening there? Uh, we definitely use single trades. We've got a good team of trades, so we don't try to get new trades in all the time. Mm -hmm. um, you sell a lot of property. Um, are you selling property to people that are going to rent it out, or like, is there a typically is there a build yeah. shortage? Like, how how are we not keeping up with the population coming in? Look, I, I think um, what really Martin touched on earlier, but people got a bit scared. Um, lending's got a bit tougher. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can manufacture a way to create income, which the bank wants to see, then servicing does that. What I don't think has to happen is the traditional way of thinking, which is I'll go and get a loan from ABC Bank, is not applying. What we really need now is we need innovators and we need investors that really want to create, um, I guess, solutions, is to really put their thinking in caps on and go, okay, I'll go to this lender that takes into this income and, uh, and it's not going to affect my equity. So I, I believe that there is definitely a solution, but I think what's happening is that the builders are also scared. Um, I don't think they're taking on a lot of new jobs. Obviously, with some other recent collapses that have happened out there, um, builders don't, they're not taking on jobs that are 12 months out. So what used to happen uh, when I worked for some of the bigger builders is we'd take jobs out there that are 12 to 15 to 18 months and, and we'd have them in what's called an order bank. Um, nowadays, unless the land's titled or within 90 days, people don't really want to know about it. And the issues that happen with that is it's a short-term fix. <laughs> it's just getting to the next quarter, the next quarter, the next quarter. Yeah. But the, the biggest problem I see right now is there's so many things heading towards the one place, right? So we've got trading shortages across the country. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's not a huge amount of um, money being spent on getting more out. Um, you then have the National Construction Code um, combining essentially with the LHA, the Liv mm -hmm. Livable Housing um, Guidelines. And th those guidelines are going to mean that the cost of building is going to go up even further. So because you now you have to have wider hallways, you're going to have to have the sort of disability bathrooms mm -hmm. and all these bits and pieces put into the housing. Um, we now got... Um, you know, places where the new, we have 700,000 houses short by the end of 2030 in Australia, just on current. And if you look around the world, um, you know, where, who handled COVID the best? Well, us and New Zealand. So you want to become, if, as an immigrant, would you like to come to Australia to Hobbit Town? Like your choices are pretty <laughs> limited, right? So um, everyone's coming to Australia. Yeah. So the Builders Grant worked brilliantly. It, it was the only thing I probably said that wouldn't work and it did, right? Mm -hmm. um, what they would have done much better is said to every landlord in Australia, if you're a landlord right now, and look, let, there's, there's about a million um, properties in, that are, uh, that are in property investors that own two or more properties, mum and dad investors, right? So if you just said to, the, to those, you said to half of them, a million of them, let's just um, take one of your houses, so 500,000, mm -hmm. and let's turn them into co-living and convert them. We do those in four weeks, right? So we would take 500,000, we would put um, you know, two and a half million new front doors on the marketplace within the next nine months. Mm -hmm. And if you just gave someone $25,000, I'd do it. Even better, we're not going to give you $25,000. We're not charging you land tax for the next five years because you converted your property. You watch the Australian investors jump on that because no one, no one in Australia likes paying tax. I love it, but others don't. This has been such an important topic and we'll be following up again on this next week. Guys, thank you so much for being on this, uh, this particular panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Steve. Steve. And that's all for this week and thank you for joining us. If you want to see the full interviews, check out our website. And we'll see you again next week.